Last week, I began a two-week or two-part series on the subject of suicide. And to be honest with you, I never really thought that I would teach on this subject. But we've had several teenagers in our community that have committed suicide. So my staff asked me to do a series on it, and I kind of blew them off. And the reason they asked me to do a series is because they had so many people asking them questions and wanting to know about what happens to a person who commits suicide. And as I said, I, I really didn't give it much thought until my wife approached me and said, Honey, you really do need to teach on this subject. She said, People are asking questions, and we really don't know what to say to them. We don't have the answers. So if you would teach a series on this subject, then when the questions are asked, we would have the resources to be able to give to those people. So I agreed to do it. To be honest with you, I'm a figurehead leader. Lisa's the leader of the church, so when she tells me to do something, I do it. But uh, that's why I'm teaching on the subject of suicide. Now, as I told you last week, the number one risk factor of suicide is depression. And there are two types of depression. Situational depression and physiological depression. Situational depression is when you're depressed over a situation in your life. And last week, I gave you an example, and that example was Job. Job is someone who experienced situational depression. If you remember, he lost all of his children and all of his wealth all in the same day. And it threw him into depression. We're talking about severe depression to the point that he not only despaired of his life, but his wife was encouraging him to curse God and to die. Now, people, that was normal. And the reason I say it's normal is because if he had not felt that way, he would have been abnormal. But that's what situational depression is. It's when something bad happens in your life and it causes you to become depressed. And depending upon how bad the situation is determines how long the depression will last. Now, every person suffers situational or from situational depression from time to time because you can't go through life without bumps and bruises and life doesn't always work out the way that we thought it would I mean you know what I'm talking about look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verses 11 and 12 and I'll show you what I'm talking about it says I have observed something else under the sun the fastest runner doesn't always win the race and the strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle Goliath can t testify to that. The wise sometimes go hungry, and the skillful are not necessarily wealthy. And those who are educated don't always lead successful lives. It is all decided by chance by being in the right place at the right time. People can never predict when hard times might come. Like fish in a net or birds in a trap, people are caught by sudden tragedy. So when things don't work out the way that we think they should, it's depressing. But it's also a part of life. And that's why I say that we all suffer from situational depression from time to time. Now, physiological depression is totally different than situational depression. Physiological depression is when everything is going great in a person's life, but they still feel depressed. In this case, the problem is usually a depletion of the neurotransmitter serotonin. You see, serotonin is what gives us that sense of well-being. It's called the happy chemical. So if you have less than the normal amounts of serotonin, you're going to experience depression. Now, as I said last week, physiological depression is a medical condition that needs to be treated. It's no different than sugar diabetes, high blood pressure, or high cholesterol. The problem is you have less than the normal amounts of serotonin, and that's what's causing your depression. And antidepressants depressants can fix the problem. You see, antidepressants help to gradually restore the brain's chemical balance by blocking the absorption of serotonin. And they won't turn you into a zombie. People, that's a myth. And one of the reasons that people believe that is because 40 to 50 years ago, they really didn't have the type of medication that we have today. So if someone was going through depression, then doctors would sedate them. And they literally looked like they were zombies. So we kind of have that impression today that if you're taking antidepressants, you're going to be turned into a zombie. And people, that's not true. They simply help you be yourself. They restore you to the way you should be. Now, let me give you the symptoms that doctors look for in diagnosing physiological depression. We'll put these on our website so you don't have to write them down. In fact, you can go to our website, 
immediately after the services if you want to. We put them on last night, so you could have got them last night. And you can print these out, but here are the symptoms. Feelings of sadness, emptiness, or unhappiness. Loss of interest or pleasure in normal activities. Now, these first two are the most important. And I'll explain why in just a second, but let me read them again. And even when you print out this list, I would encourage you to highlight these first two, and I'll explain why in just a second. Feelings of sadness, emptiness, or unhappiness. Loss of interest or pleasure in normal activities. Angry outbursts, irritability, or frustration even over small matters. If you're really becoming frustrated or you're irritable over these small matters, that's one of the symptoms. Sleep disturbances, including insomnia or sleeping too much. Tiredness and lack of energy so that even the small tasks take extra effort. Changes in appetite. For most people, it's reduced appetite, which means that you're going to lose weight. But for some, it's different. It's increased cravings for food, and they gain weight. Anxiety, agitation, or restlessness. For example, excessive worrying, pacing, hand wringing, or inability to sit still. In fact, let me give an example to illustrate what this is. I once had a person that came to my office and they were suffering from depression. I kind of went through these symptoms and I could tell that they were suffering from depression. And uh, they were literally taking their hands and they were doing this for the first couple of minutes. And then all of a sudden they just popped up and they started walking and pacing in my office. And I did my best to try to get them to go to the doctor so that they could be put on some antidepressants. But because of what they considered to be the stigma of being on that, they refused to do that. I want to tell you what happened after that. Now, the technical term for this is psychomotor agitation. I know that sounds technical, but that's what it is. Basically, it's your motor skills. They're agitated as a result of that. You're wringing your hands. You're pacing. You're worrying all the time. Slowed thinking, speaking, or body movements. Basically, your motor skills are starting to slow down. Let me give you an example of this. Sometimes when a person's depressed and you ask them a question, if they're looking at the floor, it seems like it takes them forever to raise their head. It goes something like this. And then when you ask them a question, they answer in such a slow process. It's almost as if they're in slow motion. It's like they really can't put their thoughts together. They can't finish their sentence. So they talk. Kind of like this, in spurts. People, that's called psychomotor retardation. That's the technical term. Feelings of worthlessness or guilt, fixating on past failures or blaming yourself for things that are not your responsibility. Now, if you have a problem child, you probably suffer from depression. You probably have guilt. You blame yourself for things that's not your responsibility. I, you have to understand, and this is why counseling is good, every person that's born is a personal, sovereign, rational being with a free will. That means your child has a free will. But many times when we have a problem child, we have guilt. We take personal responsibility for something that's not our responsibility. Trouble thinking, concentrating, making decisions, and remembering things. Suicidal thoughts. Unexplained physical problems such as back pain or headaches. Now, before you jump to any conclusions, just listen to me. You need to have five or more of these symptoms to be diagnosed with depression because it's possible to have up to four of these symptoms and not be suffering from depression. So doctors look for five or more of these symptoms. And of those five, at least one of the symptoms has to be feelings of sadness, emptiness, or unhappiness, or loss of interest or pleasure in normal activities. In other words, you have to have at least one of the two uh, symptoms that I first gave you. Remember the first two, and I said these are the two most important? You have to have at least one of those two symptoms plus four more to be diagnosed with depression. Does that make sense? Now this is very important. If you're going through a dramatic or traumatic situation, you're going to experience some of these symptoms, but it's not physiological depression. It's situational depression. Physiological and situational depression suffer from the very same symptoms. You see, depression is depression whether it's physiological or situational. But if it's situational depression, what you need is love, understanding, and encouragement. Because once the situation passes, the depression leads. 
Am I making sense? Now, if that situation prolongs itself, it can cause you to begin to sink further and further into hopelessness. You'll begin to have more and more of these symptoms, and then you need to understand that you're still going to need medication, even though it's situational de uh, depression. But you need to understand if it's situational depression, and that's going to pass, and that depression is also going to pass when the situation takes care of itself. But... If everything else is going great in your life and you have at least five of these symptoms and one of them is one of the first two, it's either feelings of sadness, emptiness, or unhappiness or loss of interest or pleasure in normal activities, then you have physiological depression and you need to be on antidepressants. Why suffer when you don't have to? Why be at risk when you don't have to? And parents, listen to me. Why do you want to put your child... At risk. Now, as I told you last week, depression alone is not enough to make a person attempt suicide. There's usually another contributing factor that causes a person to attempt suicide, and that contributing factor is the feeling of hopelessness. Hopelessness. You see, hope is what keeps a person going. It's the belief that things will get better if you just keep trudging on. But if they ever lose hope, they're in deep trouble because They've lost the incentive they need to keep going in life. So the chances of them attempting suicide rises dramatically. Now listen to me. The more depressed a person is, the easier it is for them to sink into hopelessness. Let me say that again. The more de depressed a person is, the easier it is for them to sink into hopelessness. And that is a dangerous combination. That's why it's so important to recognize the symptoms of depression and if someone is depressed, to get them help. Now, let me give you the warning signs of suicide. Again, these are going to be on the website, so you don't have to, have to write them down. You can actually go to our website and just print them out. The first one, depression. Now, people, that's a no-brainer, but you need to understand something. This is the major warning sign. Why? Because depression is the first risk factor. It's the number one risk factor of suicide. And if a person is depressed, the more they're depressed, the easier it is for them to sink into hopelessness. And if they sink into hopelessness, that is the perfect combination for wanting to, to attempt or wanting to commit suicide. Let's look at the next warning sign. Talking about death and or no reason to live. Losing interest in things they used to care about. Begins withdrawing from friends. Starts putting affairs in order, tying up loose ends and giving away prized possessions. People, this is a biggie. If you see someone who's depressed and they start getting together all of their bank accounts and they want you to know about it, this is where my checking is, this is where my savings accounts are, I've got these many IRAs, I've got this in my 401k, they start telling you where the life insurance policy is, uh, they start wanting to change their will, and then they start giving away their possessions. People, that's not a good sign. Start visiting or calling people to say goodbye. If someone just comes by and says, I haven't seen you in a long time, you know, I just thought, I just need to visit people I haven't seen in a long time, and I wanted to give you something, and they start giving away things that really have sentimental value to them. People, that is a biggie, big warning sign. If they switch from being very sad and agitated to being calm or even happy, in fact, this is why most people don't catch it. After someone commits suicide, they'll say, well, you know, I just saw them. In fact, they came over, and, you know, they just said they wanted to see me, and they actually gave me something, and then all of a sudden it hits them. Well, I didn't recognize it because they seemed happy. The reason they seem happy is because they've decided, I'm going to commit suicide. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it, and this is what I'm going to do. It. So if you see a depressed person, and they change from being sad to happy, and they're giving things away, and they're going to different people, and they're saying goodbye, they're putting their affairs in order, that's a very, very dangerous sign. Begin saying things like, it would be better for everyone if I wasn't here, or I just want out. Now, if someone's depressed and they start exhibiting these signs, you need to take it seriously. And you need to get them help from a professional health care provider immediately. People don't wait. In fact, in our bulletins today, we have contact information for three different healthcare professionals, and they go to our church. They are the ones that you need to contact 
don't contact me. I know some of you think, oh, I can't believe you said that. Listen to me. I am not a professional health care provider. All you're doing is wasting time. In fact, here's what normally takes place. Someone comes in, they want to see me, they bring the person in, and I talk to them. And what I try to do is I try to tell them, you need to see a professional health care provider. But here's the problem. Because you brought them to me, they think they've already tried, and they don't go to the second person, the person they really need to go to. People, my degree is in New Testament Greek and biblical studies. You need to take them to a counselor who can see the warning signs. And the very first thing they'll do is they'll get you scheduled to be able to see a medical doctor who can prescribe antidepressants. And the reason you need to go to a counselor is because antidepressants normally will take four to six weeks before they can actually restore your brain's chemical balance. Before they can really get you to the point where your serotonin levels are where they need to be. And during that four to six weeks, you need someone to teach you how to use coping skills. See, most people don't know how or don't have any coping skills for depression. And that's why I always recommend not only do you need to get on antidepressants, but you need to get counseling. So the first thing that you need to do is you need to get a hold of a professional health care provider and you need to go with them. So if you didn't pick up a bulletin, you need to have that at your house. It might not be someone in your family, but you might have a friend that has someone in their family. And if they're telling you that so-and-so in their family is depressed and they start telling you things that you're doing and you recognize these signs, you want to be able to tell them, you need to do this and you need to do it now. Now in the past, the church has treated suicide as if it was the unpardonable sin. In fact, the church taught that if a person committed suicide, they couldn't go to heaven. They went to hell. How many of you have been taught that? Yeah, we've all been taught that. Well, let me show you why the church treated suicide that way. Augustine was really the very first scholar that addressed the issue of suicide. And what he taught laid the foundation for the church's position on suicide. What Augustine taught is that a person who commits suicide is guilty of breaking the sixth commandment, which is, thou shalt not kill. And killing is a mortal sin. Now, does everyone know what a mortal sin is? How many of you were not raised in the Catholic Church? I was not raised in the Catholic Church. So you probably don't know the difference between a mortal sin and a venial sin. So let me explain what a mortal sin is. The Roman Catholic Church divides sin into two categories. Mortal sins and venial sins. Now the word mortal means fatal or causing death. So if we say that someone has mortal wounds, what we're saying is those wounds are fatal. Those wounds are going to cause their death. We're not going to be able to stop it because they have mortal wounds. Those wounds are fatal. So a mortal sin is a sin that's so heinous, it actually separates a person from the grace of God, which means that person is damned if they're not absolved of that sin. In other words, they're condemned to go to hell if they're not absolved of that sin, if they're not forgiven. Now the word venial means easily excused or forgiven because it's a minor infraction. So a venial sin is a minor sin that doesn't separate a person from the grace of God, which means that a person can still go to heaven when they die, even if they've not been absolved of that sin. Now, the passage of Scripture that Roman Catholics use to support their belief that sin is divided into these two categories, mortal sins and venial sins, is 1 John chapter 5, verses 16 through 17. Now, let me answer a question before I read this. Some of you are probably thinking, well, Pastor, we're not Roman Catholics. We're not from the Catholic Church. So why are you going and giving us this background? Well, you need to understand the history of the church and how they came to this conclusion that a person who commits suicide isn't going to heaven, they're going to hell. Because the Protestant church broke out of the Catholic church. And what we're going to find out is they didn't change their position on suicide. So you have to understand the history. So you have to understand that Roman Catholics divide sin into two basic groups, mortal sins and venial sins, and this is the passage of Scripture that they use. Let's read it. If you see a Christian brother or sister sinning in a way that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give that person life. But there is a sin that leads to death. And I'm not saying that you should pray for those who commit it. All wicked actions are sins, but not every sin leads to death. Now this is 1 John chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. But what I want to do is I want to read this passage of Scripture from the New Revised Standard Version. The RSV, except it's the New RSV. Very, very similar to it, but let me read it from it. If you see your brother or sister committing what is not a 
mortal sin. You will ask and God will give life to such a one. To those who sin is not mortal. There is a sin that is mortal. I do not say that you should pray about that. So based on this passage of scripture, Roman Catholics believe that there are two types of sin. Mortal sins, which are sins that lead to death, and venial sins, which don't lead to death. Now, why does one lead to death and one, why does one not? Well, a mortal sin leads to death because it cuts you off, it severs you from the grace of God. And life comes from the grace of God. Venial sins do not separate you from the grace of God. At least this is what Roman Catholics believe. Do you see the difference? Now, according to Augustine, suicide violates the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. So the Roman Catholic Church considers suicide to be a mortal sin. And a mortal sin separates a person from the grace of God, which means they're damned unless they're absolved of that sin. And since they're dead because they committed suicide, they can't repent, therefore they can't be absolved of that sin. You see, according to the Catholic Church, repentance needs to be uh, part of the process before you can be absolved of your sin. If you can't repent, then you can't be absolved of that sin. So if you commit suicide, you're dead. You can't repent. Therefore, you can't be absolved of that sin. And that was a mortal sin, not a venial sin. So it cuts you off from the grace of God, which means a person who commits suicide cannot go to heaven. They go to hell. So historically, the church has taught that anyone who commits suicide isn't going to heaven. They're going to hell. And even though Protestants broke away from the Catholic church, they kept the Catholic view of suicide. But they did it for a different reason. They did it for a different reason. You see, Protestants don't believe that sin is categorized into two groups, mortal sins and venial sins. No, Protestants believe that the only sin that leads to death is the rejection of Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You see, when John was writing his epistles, the church was being persecuted. And many believers were walking away from their faith in Jesus Christ in order to avoid persecution. So John wanted to actually remind his readers that the only sin that couldn't be forgiven was the sin of rejecting Jesus Christ. All other sins are forgiven when a person accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Past, present, and future. And so... When the church was being persecuted, he penned this in 1 John chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. He wrote this to remind them that they needed to remain in Christ Jesus. The only sin that can't be forgiven is the rejection of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But that's why you don't hear Protestants talking about mortal sins and venial sins. So if that's the case... Why did the Protestant churches hold to the Catholic position that those who commit suicide can't go to heaven, they go to hell? Does anyone know? Well, it all goes back to one particular scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. If you would, write that down. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. This is what it says. Do you not know that you are a temple of God? and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. Now, most people interpret this passage of Scripture to say that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if we destroy our temple, that is to say our body, then God will destroy us. How many of you have always uh, interpreted that Scripture to say that? No? No? You didn't even know about this scripture? Well, basically, this is the scripture that Protestants used to say. That if you destroy your body, if you destroy the temple of God, then God will destroy you. And that's how the church has always translated or interpreted this passage of scripture. But people, that is not what this passage of scripture is saying. It's talking about the church, the body of believers, not our individual physical bodies. Now, later on in chapter 6, Paul will talk about our individual bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit. But in this particular passage of Scripture, Paul is talking about the church, the body of Jesus Christ, the body of believers, not our individual physical bodies. And let me prove it to you. Look at verse number 16 again, and I want you to underline the word you in the phrase, you are a temple of God, and the last word in that sentence, or that last word in that verse, you. You. 
Notice what it says. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Now, in English, the word you is ambiguous. And the reason I say that is because you can't always tell if someone is talking to a single person when they use the word you or if they're talking to a group of people when they use the word you. Let me give an example. If I look over at Lisa and I point at her and I say, you need to get your Bible out. Most of you will assume that I'm only talking to her. Why? Because I looked at her and I pointed at her. Thought I saw a highlighter over there. Anyways. But if I look at you, notice I use the word you. What am I doing? I'm talking about all of you. If I look at you and I say, you need to get your Bible out. Most of you will assume that I'm not talking to one singular person, but I'm talking to all of you. But you have to gather what I mean from the context. You have to gather what I mean from my body language. Did I look at a single person or did I look at everyone? Did I point at a single person or did I point at everyone? So in English, the word you is kind of ambiguous. It can refer to one person or it can refer to a group of people. But in Greek, it's not that way. In fact, in Greek, the words are different depending upon whether it's plural or singular. Well, in this case, it's plural. In fact, let's look at the original Greek. I'm going to put it here on the back screen, and let me translate this for you because that's my degree. Now, the Bible is, is written in original languages. In the Old Testament, it's Hebrew. In the New Testament, it's Greek. And my degree is in New Testament Greek. Now, by the time I finished with school... I could basically translate almost any verse from the New Testament. But I haven't used it. And if you don't use it, you lose it. But I can kind of hunt and peck. And most of the time, I will translate verses that I'm going to be using in my sermons. So let me just translate this for you. Odate, that is, know you not that, and then I have to come to iste, you are a temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, see these two words, esta and human? Esta means you are. It's second plural present indicative of I me. If you know a little bit of Greek, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Human is locative plural masculine of su. But the thing that I want you to see is it's plural. It's not talking to one individual, but it's talking to a group. So when Paul was writing to the Corinthians, he said, you, plural, are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And he was talking to all of the Christians at Corinth collectively, which means he was talking to the church, not individuals. So what Paul was saying is that if you destroy God's church, the body of believers, the body of Jesus Christ, God will destroy you because that's how important the church of God is. And most of us don't realize that. The most important thing to God is the body of believers. Why? Because that's his family. Let me just say this. If someone's causing problems in your family, does that irritate you? Are you protective of your family? You bet you are. Well, you need to understand something. The church is the family of God. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are believers. And so what Paul was writing to tell them is you, not you individually, but you collectively. The church is not the temple of the Holy Spirit, but a temple of the Holy Spirit. Why does it say a temple and not the temple? Because there's lots of local churches. And whenever there's a body of believers, a body of believers in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is there, and it's his family. And anyone who destroys the church, well, you've taken God off. And that's what it's saying here. So if this passage of Scripture isn't talking about suicide, and it's not, is there any other Scripture that says if a person commits suicide, they can't go to heaven, they go to hell? No. Listen to me. There is only one sin that can keep you from going to heaven. And that's the sin of rejecting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. So it's not suicide that sends a person to hell. What sends a person to hell is rejecting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. That is the only thing that can send a person to hell. So when it comes to suicide, sometimes a person gets to the place where they feel like there's no hope. 
and they can't go on. And they take their life. And though it's wrong to commit suicide, it doesn't mean that they're damned to hell. It doesn't mean that they're not going to heaven. Does that make sense? But the reason Protestants have always taught this is because of that one verse. If you destroy the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we thought he was saying, you individually, and we're going to find that's true in chapter 6, but then he's talking about it in a whole different light. In this light, he's saying if you destroy the church of God, God's family, then God will destroy you because he loves his family, he protects it, and he takes care of it. So he's not talking about suicide. So when it does come to suicide, sometimes a person gets to a place where they feel like there's no hope, they can't go on, and they take their life. And even though it's wrong to commit suicide, that does not mean they didn't go to heaven. But, and this is one of the reasons I don't like teaching on this subject, I don't want to give the impression that God condones suicide. People, he doesn't. Augustine was right. Suicide is a breaking of the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill, because the person who commits suicide is violating that commandment. They're killing. They're taking their own life, but it's still, it's still a violation of the sixth commandment. Taking a person's life, and even your own, is forbidden by God. But it's not a mortal sin. It doesn't damn you to hell. And I think that's very important because I think on top of the guilt, when I've done funerals in the past where someone's committed suicide, I'm telling you that the parents are grieving, but they've been taught. Not only did they do something wrong, not only could they not be there for their child, now you're telling me that my child can't go to heaven? And I have to tell them that's not true. But at the same time, I know that there are people who are suffering from depression and they're sinking into hopelessness. And if they hear this, they go, well, I can still go to heaven. And as a result of that, they think that it's okay to commit suicide. And let me tell you, it's not. Suicide is a very, very selfish act. In fact, it's one of the most selfish acts that a person can commit. You're not thinking about your family when you commit suicide. You're not thinking about your loved ones when you commit suicide. You're not concerned about God and his plan that he has for you. You're not willing to suffer for the Lord's sake. You're only concerned about yourself. You're only concerned about your suffering. You're only concerned about your pain and you don't care about anyone else. And let me tell you, when you commit suicide, you destroy the people around you. If you study the prophets, one of the things that you'll find out is that every one of the prophets suffered from, from depression. And the reason I say that everyone suffered from depression is because they went through tough times, which means that they suffer from situational depression. And there are several of them that I wonder if they didn't actually suffer from physiological depression because it was almost as if they were depressed all the time, even when things were going good. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. Ezekiel went through some horrible things. How would you like to lie on your side for 430 days? How would you like to walk around naked? Of course, he had a loincloth. It means something totally different from us. How would you like to take human dung and build a fire out of it? How would you like to be laughed at and to be scorned? Most of these prophets were that way. When you look at David, you know David went through situational depression for 14 years he was on the run. For 14 years, Saul tried to take his life. It got so bad that he literally had to move his parents from the land of Israel to the land of Ammon and Moab. He actually had to take them to what is now modern-day Jordan just to protect them from Saul. He literally had to go live with the Philistines and act like he was crazy. For 14 years, he did that. And then he had problem children. He had one child that raped another, then one child killed that person who raped. He had... Absalom tried to overthrow him and take his kingdom. I tell you, David went through some horrible, horrible things. 
But the one thing they never did is they never gave up on God. And no matter if they even caused their own suffering, they always came to the point and said, God, forgive me. Let me do your will. And let me just say this. Suicide is one of the most selfish acts that you can do because what you're literally saying is, I don't want to have to suffer for Jesus Christ. I don't want to have to suffer for God. I don't care about my plan, what he has for me. I don't care about my family. I don't care about my loved ones. I just want to end it. Now, I understand pain and suffering but let me tell you our hope is in Jesus Christ and that's why it's very important that if you're depressed you do not stay home you get to church every Sunday every Wednesday night you get involved in in, in discipleship programs you get involved in Bible studies you go see a Christian counselor and you get on antidepressants but I do believe it's time for the church to quit judging people who are depressed because I would dare say that probably 50% of the people at any given time are going through some situation that's depressed them and or they have physiological depression and we've made people feel guilty if they ask for help and as a result of that we isolate them and make them feel more and more alone our job is to help them